who were recorded at Sound City, and we're lucky to have a bunch of them here with us today. In these interviews, they'll tell you we had to play it 50, 100 times. We had to play it so many times, we didn't want to hear that song for another year. But if you wanted a song to sound perfect, you had to play it perfectly. So musicians out there, practice your craft until it hurts. And if you want to see how it is done right, go see the one and only Sound City Players tonight, and they are going to rip the face off of Stubbs. So, without further ado, it is my honor to welcome South by Southwest 2013 keynote speaker, Mr. Dave Grohl. Hi, everybody. Hey! Good morning. Hello. Look at you. <clears throat> Please have a seat. I got these at the drugstore because I'm going blind. I hope, I hope I still look like a rock star. <clears throat> Thank you, South by Southwest, very much for allowing me the incredible opportunity of being this year's keynote speaker. Having been raised by a former DC political speech writer and a former public speaking teacher, it's practically written in my DNA zipper that I should feel the insatiable need to stand in front of a room of total strangers and bullshit them. <laughs> As a child, my father's lectures were legendary and frequent. Great works of literature that stay with me to this day and, if anything, taught me how to give long fucking lectures myself. <clears throat> Not long ago, I was lucky enough to sit down with another one of my favorite public speakers, the one, the only, Mr. Bruce Springsteen. Bruce, as you would imagine, is a warm, funny, brilliant man, and a wonderful dinner guest. I congratulated him on last year's amazing keynote, quoting his insight and his humor. And then I told him that this year's keynote speaker was me. <laughs> he stared at me for a moment, and slowly cracked that famous smile that we all know and love, the smile that can light up an entire stadium. And then he started laughing <laughs> at me, as if to say, good fucking luck, buddy. <laughs> but truth be told, that's not the first time anyone's ever said that to me. So it's without a doubt my musical life's greatest honor to be asked to share with you what I know about music. So, what do I know? The musician comes first. My mother tells me that I was born to applause. The morning of January 14, 1969, there was a class of young doctors in a small delivery room in Warren, Ohio, there to witness their first live birth. As I was born, the room burst into applause. <laughs> My first moments in this world. Hanging upside down, covered in blood, screaming as I'm being spanked by a complete stranger. <laughs> Perhaps the most appropriate preparation for becoming a working musician. <laughs> now, before we go any further, I have to thank someone. I have to thank Edgar Winter for allowing KTEL Records to include his legendary instrumental Frankenstein on their 1975 blockbuster compilation. It was this record that my sister and I bought at the drugstore down the street and brought home to play on the 
public school turntable that my mother would borrow from school on the weekends. It was this record that changed my life. A veritable who's who of 1975 radio hits. But it wasn't KC and the Sunshine Band's That's the Way, Uh Uh-huh, Uh-Huh, I Like It (laughs) that made me want to pick up the dusty old guitar in the corner. No. And it wasn't Dave Loggins' Please Come to Boston (laughs) or Silver Convention's Fly Robin Fly that made me want to jump in a van and leave the world behind for music. No. It was... It was a riff. I gave it all up for a fucking riff. (laughs) Interestingly enough, though, that song is completely instrumental. There's no vocal. It's drums, guitars, keyboards, percussion, each getting a solo in the song. No vocals. But what I heard in all of those solos were voices. The voices of each musician, their personalities, their technique, their feel, the sound of people playing music with other people. It made me want to play music with other people, too. So it wasn't long until I had my first guitar, an old Sears Silvertone with the amp built into the case, and it smelled like an old attic full of mothballs and burning wire and sounded like that goats yelling like humans (laughs) YouTube clip that's popular right now. If you haven't seen it, it's fucking hilarious. (laughs) But it instantly became my obsession. It was this guitar and a Beatles songbook that <laughs> that ultimately set my life in <clears throat> one direction. <laughs> Never one for taking lessons or direction. I was left to my own devices and devoted every waking hour to playing music. It became my religion. The record store, my church, the rock stars, my saints, and their songs, my hymns. Springfield, Virginia wasn't necessarily known for breeding rock stars. A career in music never really seemed possible to me. It just seemed too good to be true. Surely the faces on my KISS posters weren't getting paid to do this. Gene Simmons, imagine. (laughs) But that never mattered to me because I had finally found my voice. And that was all I needed to survive from now on. The reward of playing a song from beginning to end without making a mistake. Well, that was enough to feed me for weeks. The discovery of a new chord or a new scale could make me forget about that kid at high school who wanted to kick my fucking ass, or that cute chick with the lip gloss and the soft sweater I had a crush on who wouldn't give me the time of day. I liked my new voice, because no matter how bad it sounded, it was mine. There was nobody there to tell me what was right or what was wrong. So there was no right or wrong. Now, as much as I wanted to be in a band, I was there, alone in my bedroom, day in and day out, with my records and my guitar, playing with myself (laughs) for hours. I would set up pillows in the formation of a drum set on my bed and play along to records until there was literally sweat dripping down the Rush posters on my walls. Eventually, I figured out how to be a one-man band. I took my guitar, (laughs) 
and my crappy old handheld tape recorder. I put one cassette in this tape recorder and I hit record. I took this cassette, put it in my home stereo. I took another cassette, <laughs> put this in the handheld recorder, played it back, hit record on this one, and I would play drums. Take this cassette, <laughs> put it back in the home stereo, rewind it, play, and there you have it. At 12 years old, I was multi tracking songs in my bedroom <laughs> all by myself. To my chagrin, though, what I got was not Sgt. Pepper's. <laughs> Rather, a collection of songs about my dog, my bike, and my dad. <laughs> Nevertheless, I had done all of this myself, therefore making the reward even sweeter. But still, I longed to share this newfound obsession with other people. Eventually, I found a kid up the street with an old drum set. I found a kid down the street with an old bass. I found a kid across the street with an old basement. And we found a kid across town with an old PA. Several awkward jam sessions later, and we had a band. Obstacle one cleared. When asked what our na band name was upon submitting our official entry to our high school Battle of the Bands, we applied as nameless. We just couldn't fucking come up with anything better than that. <laughs> you laugh, but finding a good band name is still the hardest fucking part. I hope you know that. I mean, Foo Fighters, it's the stupidest fucking name in the world. <laughs> it was chill. <laughs> Obstacle two, diverted. That night, Kenny Loggins' footloose never sounded so brave. <laughs> Unfortunately, our enthusiastic rendition wasn't enough to uh, seize the title of best band at Thomas Jefferson High School, but we carried on. We tried our damnedest at Bowie and Zepp and Who and Cream and Kinks and Hendrix. We even played the Rolling Stones' Time is on my side at a fucking nursing home. <laughs> and then I went to Chicago. It was 1982, and on my mother's meager public school teacher's salary, our family had planned the trip to the great city of Chicago to visit our relatives who had lived in a suburb up north, right on the lake. We stuffed everything that we could into our tiny baby blue Ford Fiesta and started driving. A week and a half of swimming and Italian beef sandwiches was in order, though, upon arrival, the tone of our trip was instantly defined. My older cousin, Tracy, was now a punk rocker. At first, I heard her coming down the stairs. The clanking of chains, the stomping of heavy boots, the sound of a fresh leather jacket creaking like an old ship. 
And then I saw her. Shaved head, bondage pants, torn Andy Pasty t-shirt. She was a fucking superhero. <laughs> Come to life. Something I'd only seen on the TV shows Quincy or Chips. <laughs> my heart started racing, my eyes widened, my throat clenched. I stood there speechless and in awe. Tracy was my first hero. She took me upstairs to her bedroom and showed me her incredible record collection, stacks and stacks of seven inches and LPs with names I'd never heard before. Names like The Misfits and Bad Brains and Minor Threat and Dead Kennedys and The Germs and Flipper and Circle Jerks and Discharge and Crass and Conflict, Black Flag, White Flag, Void, Faith, The Dicks, The Dickies, The Minutemen, The Adolescents, The Ramones, The Big Boys, GBH, DRI, SOA, DOA, MDC, MIA, CIA, <laughs> Crucifix, Crucifux, <laughs> X, X-ray specs, Wire, Sex Pistols, The Buzzcocks, Rights of the Accused, The Necros, Fang, Government Issue, The Descendants. I sat down and I played every last one. This was the first day of the rest of my life. That night I went to my first concert, though it wasn't in an arena. It was a dingy little hole in the wall directly across the street from Wrigley Field called the Cubby Bear. There you go. And it wasn't any band I'd ever heard of. It was a local Chicago punk rock, punk rock band by the name of Naked Ray Gun. And with the one, two, three, four, the band kicked in and the most ferocious noise, bodies were flying everywhere, spit and sweat and leather and volume and broken glass and piss and fucking puke. I was in heaven. <laughs> and it was our secret. The next day I took the L to Wax Tracks Records. I bought a Killing Joke t-shirt and the soundtrack to the decline of civil Western civilization. I was converted. I was no longer one of you. I was one of us. But more than the noise and the rebellion and the danger, it was the blissful removal of these bands from any source of conventional popular corporate structure and the underground network that supported the music's independence that was totally inspiring to me. At 13 years old, I realized I could start my own band, I could write my own song, I could record my own record, I could start my own label, I could release my own record, I could book my own shows, I could write and publish my own fanzine, I could silkscreen my own t-shirts, I could do this all by myself. There was no right or wrong, because it was all mine. Upon returning to Washington, D.C., I dove headfirst into the local hardcore punk rock scene. Little did I know that one of the country's most prolific and influential music scenes was right there in my own backyard, Washington, D.C. Minor Threat, Bad Brains, Scream, these bands were now my Beatles and my Stones my Zeppelin, my Dylan, and these were the fucking Reagan years. So protest music was on fire. My first punk rock show back at home was actually the Rock Against Reagan concert, July 4th, 1983. With the stage built at the base of the Lincoln Memorial steps on Independence Day, it was a recipe for disaster. 700,000 barefoot, sunburned rednecks from Maryland and Virginia and Leonard Skinner and Judas Priest t-shirts, stonewashed jeans and bandanas, converging on the nation's capital to watch fireworks, coolers full of beer and southern comfort, only to find Texas's own dirty, rotten imbeciles singing their song, I Don't Need Society. <laughs> Your number's up. You have to go. The system says I told you so, stocked in a train like a truckload of cattle, sent off to slaughter in a useless battle, thousands of us sent off to die, never really knowing why. Fuck the system, they can't have me. I don't need society. 
I don't need society. It was a fucking riot waiting to happen. I actually bought that record that day from the lead singer out of the back of his van. It was a 33 song seven inch. <laughs> Stuffed in a homemade sleeve. It is still, to this day, one of my most prized possessions. When the sun had gone down and the legendary Dead Kennedys finally came on stage, lead singer Jello Biafra pointed and screamed at the Washington Monument, calling it the great Klansman in the sky with its two blinking red eyes. <laughs> well, that was it. The powder keg finally blew. Helicopters buzzed overhead, shining spotlights into the crowd as policemen on horses beat their way through the punks with their billy clubs. It was right out of apocalypse now. This was my Woodstock. This was my Altamont. This was rock and roll. No matter what t-shirt you had or what fucking haircut you had, this was fucking real. I burned inside. I was possessed and empowered and inspired and enraged and so in love with life and so in love with music that it had the power to incite a fucking riot or an emotion or to start a revolution or just to save a young boy's life. So I joined a band. I dropped out of high school. I hit the fucking road. I starved. My hands bled. If I slept, I slept on floors, I slept on stages, I slept on the fucking floors, under the fucking stages. And I loved every minute of it because I was free. And I wanted to incite a riot or an emotion or a revolution or to save someone's life by inspiring them to pick up an instrument just as I did as a kid. I wanted to be someone's Edgar Winter I wanted to be someone's naked ray gun. I wanted to be someone's bad brains or beetles because that was the reward. That was the intention. We played that type of music, so everyone left us alone. There was no career opportunity. There was no Hall of Fame. There were no trophies. There were no A&R guys buying fucking Benihana dinners. <laughs> our reward was knowing that we had done all of this on our own and it was real. But inevitably, it wasn't long before I found myself stranded in Hollywood without a cent to my name and no way home, crashed out in a Laurel Canyon bungalow with a bunch of female mud wrestlers. <laughs> Don't ask. That's a whole other fucking keynote address right there. And that's when I heard the five words that changed my life forever. Have you heard of Nirvana? So, Nirvana were one of us, raised on Credence and Flipper and Beatles and Black Flag. They seem to share the same ideals the same intentions, but they had something more. They had songs. <laughs> they had Kurt. And what they didn't have was a drummer. So without hesitation, I packed all of my drums into one big U-Haul cardboard box, grabbed my old army duffel bag, and I flew up to Seattle. We practiced in a barn every day. It was all that we had. There was no sun. There was no moon. There was just the barn. And those songs. Kurt had, without a doubt, found his voice. Every practice would begin with an improvisational freeform jam, which kind of served as an exercise in dynamic and musical collaboration, communication. We were speaking to each other without words. Verbal communication was never really Nirvana's forte. So we spoke to each other with our instruments. 
And the combination of our three voices resulted in a sound that eventually caught the ear of a major label record company. Or 10 major label record companies. Suddenly, we were thrown into a bidding war of A&R guys with fancy shoes from Fred Siegel and radio promo dudes with little one-hitters in their glove compartments and closets full of complimentary box sets and fucking Benihana every fucking night. <laughs> At one meeting, after playing a demo of our song In Bloom for Donny Einer, Yay, Donny Einer. <laughs> in his high-rise office in New York City, Donny turned to Kurt and asked, So, what do you guys want? Kurt slouched over in his chair, looked up to Donny, sitting behind his massive oak desk, and said, We want to be the biggest band in the world. I laughed. I thought he was fucking kidding. <laughs> he wasn't. Now you have to remember where music was at the time. Here are the Billboard year-end top 10 songs of 1990. Number 10, John Bon Jovi, Blaze of Glory. Number nine, Billy Idol, Cradle of Love. Number eight, En Vogue, <laughs> with Hold On. Number seven, Phil Collins, <laughs> Another Day in Paradise. <laughs> <laughs> Number six, Mariah Carey, Vision of Love. Number five, Madonna with Vogue. Number four, Bill Bev DeVoe with Poison. <laughs> Number three, Sinead O'Connor with Nothing Compares to You. <laughs> number two, Roxette with It Must Have Been Love. And the number one song of 1990, Wilson fucking Phillips. <laughs> with Hold On. How Kurt could even think we'd make a ripple <laughs> in this ridiculous mainstream world of polished pop music was beyond me. It was beyond everyone. It made absolutely no sense. It was simply unimaginable. It was the type of hopeless, shallow aspiration that we had been conditioned to reject, ultimately relieving us of any intention other than just to be ourselves. I mean, the very definition of the word nirvana in the dictionary is a place or state characterized by freedom from or oblivion to pain, worry, and the external world. We'd always been left to our own devices as musicians, day after day in our bedrooms as children, day after day in that old barn. We did everything ourselves. What did we need with that world? A few more guys with a and R guys with fancy shoes, a few more box sets, a few more dinners at fucking Benny Hong. Huh? <laughs> and we signed a deal. Following in the footsteps of our great hero, Sonic Youth, we signed to the David Geffen Company through everything in the back of our old Chevy van and headed down to Sound City. 16 days, 13 songs. We were used to recording 16 songs in one day this was the big time. All of those cold, rainy days spent in that barn, chopping away at those songs, speaking to each other without words, finding our voice. It was all for this. When we pulled into the parking lot of Sound City, I quickly realized that this was not the big, fancy, major label Hollywood recording studio I had imagined. Not at all. It was a shithole. It was a run-down, burned-out, dumpy old joint in a warehouse complex deep in the sunburned San Fernando Valley, miles away from any fucking Fred Siegel or Benihana. It was perfect 
famous for such legendary albums like Neil Young's After the Gold Rush, Fleetwood Mac's Fleetwood Mac, Tom Petty's Damn the Torpedoes, Cheap Trick's Heaven Tonight, Rick Springfield's Working Class Dog. It was hallowed ground. But it looked like no one had cleaned up the place since fucking Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks were runners there. <laughs> Brown shag carpet on the walls. <laughs> A couch they'd been renting for 10 years. <laughs> Personally, I thought it looked like a fucking Chi-Chi's that had a fire. <laughs> but upon listening back to the first take of In Bloom, we instantly understood Sound City's legacy. That room and that old Neve board captured something, something that we had never heard before. It didn't sound like the first record, Bleach. It didn't sound like the Peel sessions we had recorded for the BBC or the Sliver single or any of the demos, no. It sounded like, never mind. It was the sound of three people playing as if their life depended on it. Like they'd waited their whole lives for this moment to be captured on a reel of two inch tape. After a week or so at Sound City, for whatever reason, I started getting worried that no one from the label had come down to check out what we were doing. So I called my manager, John Silva, and I asked, hey, should we be worried? His immediate response was, fuck no, you should be happy. You don't want those fucking people down there. <laughs> As usual, he was right. And they left us alone. Well, just as we couldn't imagine making the slightest ripple in the mainstream, no one else really imagined that happening either. The initial pressing of Nevermind was around 35,000 copies, enough by their estimate to last the label a few months. A pretty good indication of everyone's expectations. Well, those were gone within a few weeks. And within a month, the record was gold. By Christmas, the record went platinum. By the new year, we were selling 300,000 records a week. That ripple that seemed so unimaginable had become a tidal wave. I never really figured out why that happened. Timing, perhaps. Legions of disaffected American youth fed up with Wilson Phillips? <laughs> Probably. But I like to think that what the world heard in Nirvana's music was the sound of three human beings three distinct personalities, their inconsistencies and their imperfections proudly on display for everyone to hear. Three people that had been left to their own devices their entire lives to find their voices. It was honest, it was pure, and it was real. Up until that point, no one had ever told me how to play or what to play. And now, no one would ever again. <laughs> the follow-up to Nevermind in Utero was a brazen example of this. Twelve songs recorded virtually live in only a few days by infamous record producer and opinionated pundit on the music industry, Steve Albini. He's a badass. <laughs> it truly was the sound of a band in a place or state characterized by freedom from or oblivion to pain, worry, and the external world. Now it was us that had the power. We weren't Nirvana anymore. We were Nirvana. <laughs> now you had to fucking leave us alone. The latchkey children that unexpectedly inherited the castle? Maybe. More like Lord of the Flies with fucking distorted guitars, really. <laughs> but where do you go from there? As an artist raised in the ethically suffocating punk rock underground, conditioned to reject conformity, to resist all corporate influence and expectation, where do you go? How do you deal with that kind of success? How do you now define success? Is it still the reward of playing a song from beginning to end without making a mistake? Is it still finding that new chord or scale that makes you forget all of your troubles? 
How do you process going from being one of us to one of them? Guilt. Guilt is cancer. It will confine you, torture you, destroy you as an artist. It's a wall. It's a black hole. It's a fucking thief. It'll keep you from you. Remember learning your first song or riff or writing your first lyric? There's no guilt then. Remember when there was no right or wrong? Remember that simple reward of just playing music? You are still and will always be that person at your core, the musician. And the musician comes first. Fuck guilty pleasure. How about just pleasure? I can truthfully say out loud that Gangnam Style is one of my favorite fucking songs of the past decade. <laughs> It is. Is it any better or worse than the latest Adams for Peace album? Hmm. If only we had a celebrity panel of judges to determine that for us. What would J-Lo do? Paging Pitchfork, come in, come in, Pitchfork. We need you to help us determine the value of a song. Who fucking cares? Who's to say what's a good voice and what's not a good voice? The voice? <laughs> Imagine Bob Dylan standing there singing Blown in the Wind in front of Christine Aguilera. <laughs> mm, I think you sound a little nasally and sharp. It's your voice. <laughs> Cherish it, respect it, nurture it, challenge it, stretch it, scream it until it's fucking gone. Because everyone's blessed with at least that. And who knows how long it will last. When Kurt died, I was lost. I was numb. The music that I had devoted my life to had now betrayed me. I had no voice. I turned off the radio. I put away my drums. I couldn't bear to hear someone else's voice singing about pain or joy. It just hurt too much. But eventually, that feeling that I had, Independence Day, July 4th, 1983, at the base of the Lincoln Memorial Steps, that feeling came back. The same feeling that made me feel possessed and empowered and inspired and enraged and so in love with life and so in love with music that it had the power to incite a riot or an emotion or start a revolution. I felt it again. I found a studio down the street. I booked six days loaded all my shit into the car, bought some good, strong fucking coffee, and I got back to work. 14 songs in five days with one day to mix. I played every instrument, running from the drums to the guitar to the coffee maker, <laughs> to the bass, to the vocal mic, to the coffee maker, back to the drums, back to the coffee maker. Here I was again, 
left to my own devices with no one to tell me right or wrong. The same one-man band 20 years ago, 20 years later, multi-tracking all on my own. The long gone were the two cassette recorders and songs about my dog, my bike, and my dad. I was singing songs about starting over. Maybe a few about my dad. I dubbed 100 cassettes. I gave it the name Foo Fighters so that people would imagine it was a group rather than just one strung out coffee junkie scrambling from instrument to instrument. I gave them to friends. I gave them to relatives. I gave them to people at fucking gas stations. I was starting over. It wasn't long before I got the call. An A&R guy. The tape was getting around. Those six days that I spent alone in the studio that I considered to be a demo, I considered an experiment. I considered it fucking therapy. They thought it was a record. I didn't even have a band. I called my brilliant friend and lawyer, Jill Berliner, for advice. You know what she told me? The musician comes first. I started my own label, Roswell Records. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, you are staring at the president of a record company. <laughs> <laughs> After all that had happened, deep down I was still the same kid that at 13 years old realized I could start my own band, I could write my own song, I could record my own record, I could start my own label, I could release my own record, I could book my own shows, I could write and publish my own fanzine, I could silk screen my own shirts, I could do all of this myself. And it may have been an entirely different world now, but once again, there was no right or wrong because it was all mine. From day one, the Foo Fighters have been fortunate enough to exist within this perfect world. We write our songs, we record our songs, we make our albums, we decide when the album is the album, we own the album, and we'll license it to you for a little while, but you gotta give it back, because it's mine. <laughs> Because I am the musician, and I come first. I have to imagine that the reason I'm here today in front of you all is exactly this. Am I the best drummer in the world? Certainly not. Am I the best singer-songwriter? Not even in this fucking room. <laughs> but I've been left alone to find my voice since that day I heard Edgar Winters Frankenstein. Recently, I directed a full-length feature documentary about the recording studio that Nirvana recorded Nevermind on over 20 years ago, Sound City. In the movie, we not only tell the story of this magical shithole, but we also explore technology and what we refer to as the human element of music. How do these things coexist? Well, there is no right or wrong. There is only your voice. Your voice screaming through an old Neve 8028 recording console. Your voice singing from a laptop. Your voice echoing from a street corner. A cello, a turntable, a guitar, Serato, a Studer. It doesn't matter. What matters most is that it's your voice. Cherish it. Respect it. Nurture it, challenge it, stretch it, and scream until it's fucking gone. Because every human being is blessed with at least that. And who knows how long it will last. It's there if you want it. Now, more than ever, independence as a musician has been blessed by the advance of technology, making it easier for any inspired young musician to start their own band write their own song, record their own record, book their own shows, write and publish their own fanzine, although now I believe you call it a blog. <laughs> <laughs> the 
Now more than ever, you can do this. And it could be all yours. And left to your own devices, you can find your voice. Recently, I came home with the new Beatles vinyl box set. It's amazing. It's the size of a fucking Toomey suitcase. It's huge. It weighs 50 pounds. As I walked into the house, my daughters, Harper, who's three, and Violet, who's six, looked up and gasped, what is that? I said, it's all of the Beatles' records. Now, I've already spent hours brainwashing them with Beatles songs. <laughs> They're cool. They know. <laughs> Good music. <laughs> I still get a little fresh beat band every now and then, but... <laughs> but this was vinyl. They'd never seen that before. I set up the turntable in their room, opened the box, and started showing them how it's done. Okay, you take the record out of the sleeve. You gotta hear the songs on this side. Here's the songs on this side. And just carefully place it on the turntable. Gently put the needle down. Careful. They were absolutely blown away. I left the room came back half an hour later, and there they were, dancing to get back. <laughs> Album covers strewn all over the floor. Does this sound familiar? We've all been there. And as a proud father, I pray that someday they're left to their own devices, and they realize that the musician comes first, and that they find their voice, and that they become someone's Edgar Winter, that they become someone's Beatles, that they incite a riot or an emotion or start a revolution or save someone's life, that they become someone's hero. But then again, what do I know? Thank you very much for your time, everybody. Dave Grohl, Dave Grohl, Mr. Dave Grohl. That was great. Okay, uh, two things. One, uh, we showed a film about our friend Brent Grohlke. Uh, earlier, we're going to show it again uh, after a few people clear out. Second, I've lost the lottery twice now, but I, I'll, I'll tell you a secret that only the locals know. The best sounding spot in Stubbs is actually a parking lot on 9th Street. <laughs> so I will see you there. So a uh, couple of minutes, we'll get this film up. And then there's a whole lot of stuff to do in the building today. I hope you'll uh, check out some of the mini conferences and panel discussions. I remember meeting him at a party that Nick Barbro had. He was a great guy, he was fun to be around. This wild party where we wound up burning a bunch of furniture. Yeah, that would have been like 83 or so. It was a remarkable period of time in which so many people you know, came together who were really gifted and really talented. <laughs>